It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Payne and Dr. Paul Sutton to speak at Medicine Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Payne is a professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine, an adjunct professor in the Departments of Health Services and Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education. He serves as the Medical Director for UW Medicine Information Technology Services and the Co-Director of Scholarship for the UW Medicine Center for Scholarship in Patient Care, Quality, and Safety. Dr. Payne obtained his medical degree from the University of Washington, followed by house staff training at the University of Colorado, and a fellowship degree in medical information science at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Payne's clinical practice is based at the General Internal Medicine Center at Roosevelt, and has previously practiced at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System, where he was very key to leading the implementation of CPRS. His research interests are centered on the use and application of clinical computing systems in patient care, clinical research, and quality improvement. Dr. Payne is distinguished as a fellow of the American College of Physicians, the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, and the American College of Medical Informatics. Dr. Paul Sutton is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine, and adjunct associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education. He serves as the Associate Medical Director for Inpatient Systems for UW Medicine IT Services. Dr. Sutton obtained his PhD in Molecular Genetics at the University of Illinois at Chicago, followed by his medical degree from the University of Chicago. He then completed his house staff training and chief residency at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Sutton's clinical practice is also based at the General Internal Medicine Center at Roosevelt and also regularly attends on the inpatient medicine services at Harborview and the UW Medical Centers. His research interests are in coordinating hospital-based computing operations with a focus on quality and safety improvements related to medical informatics. Dr. Sutton is distinguished as a fellow of the American College of Physicians and has previously been awarded the Paul Beeson Award for Excellence in Teaching. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Payne and Dr. Sutton uh, as they present the EHR in 2018, current status and future locally and nationally. Thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, and I know many people say it, uh, but it is genuinely a pleasure to uh, address this group of so many colleagues and friends um, on a topic that I think many of us have strong feelings about. Um, we were asked to give you an update on the current status of our EHRs, both here in UW Medicine, but also nationally, and a, a few words to the global movements. Um, I'd like to start with uh, one of the drivers for the movement to improve medical records, and it comes in the form of a quotation from Florence Nightingale, a nurse. In fact, one of the leading uh, leaders of the nursing movement uh, in our planet. Um, by the way, last Friday was her birthday. We celebrate it nationally as the National Nurses Day. So you can see here that uh, she had the idea that in arriving to arrive at the truth, she's applied every word of her information, but had a hard time getting uh, hospital records fit for any purposes of comparison. If they could be obtained, they would help us to decide many questions besides the one alluded to. It would show subscribers how their money was being spent, uh, what amount of good was really done for it, and whether the money was not doing mischief rather than good. So that was the vision uh, quite some time ago. Uh, by a leader in, uh, in health reform. Um, we've been pursuing that vision ever since, and it has not uh, been without its, its troubles and its struggles. So the current status is uh, one that you're all intimately aware of uh, in your personal experience, um, but I'd like to show you a publication that has been the most inspiring to me in understanding where we stand today in 2018. And this was a color diagram by an eight-year-old child who drew this picture of her visit to see her doctor. Uh, this is uh, courtesy of Betsy Toll, who published this in JAMA, and it shows the little girl on her exam table in the center of the picture with her family um, to the right, uh, her little baby brother and her mother. Um, and on the top, you can see her neighborhood, where she lives, where she plays, and goes to school. Um, now, if you look carefully on the left, you see a figure huddled over a keyboard, um, uh, not facing the patient and uh, working hard. Uh, and even though this was a very perceptive drawing by a very bright eight-year-old, she did make one mistake, and that is that the doctor is smiling. <laughs> uh, the, uh, 
the reason the doctor uh, really shouldn't be smiling is that we now know the, the difficulties that electronic medical records have uh, posed to us in our role of taking care of patients. And this is well described in the literature um, that I'm sure you're aware of. It, it increases daily. And it includes uh, very serious topics such as the contribution of electronic records to uh, physician burnout, uh, why they aren't as good as other technology in our lives, and um, some uh, conjecture as to why uh, it is as challenging as it is. I want to draw your attention to uh, Bob Wachter's book called The Digital Doctor, which is an excellent review of where we stand today and some of the problems and the promise, uh, a very engaging uh, book to read. Uh, one of these papers shown here was uh, written by Chris Zinsky and her colleagues, who was here uh, several years ago, and uh, I think opened the door to some of the difficulties that we've all experienced. Uh, one of her papers pointed out that in a time motion study in ambulatory practices in primary care, that almost twice as much time was spent in those offices uh, with the EHR and EHR-related duties as in face-to-face -face time with patients. So we have to be realistic about where we stand today. That isn't to say that we are um, satisfied with it or not working hard to improve it, which we are. Um, I'd like to start with just a brief uh, review of how we got to the state where we are today. And that is a timeline that shows about 220 years of work on, on paper and electronic <laughs> records. Uh, you can see I began this timeline with the New York Hospital uh, Register in 1805, which many regard to be a turning point in our use of records to record the practice of care. Um, Florence Nightingale's paper is on this timeline as well. Uh, Henry Plummer uh, was an influential endocrinologist and uh, advocate of the, electron of the paper record in uh, the Mayo Clinic, and that record was really viewed as a starting point for a methodical collection of information. That was in 1907. Important on this timeline also is our own country's uh, transition to electronic records on a broad scale, which was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 which offered financial incentives for um, adopting health records, uh, electronic health records, and using them in a way that was considered to be meaningful. Uh, and that led to a, a real change in the percentage of providers who are using these in our country today. If we zoom in on the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, we can see um, that uh, there's been a great deal of activity um, in, since 1965. So this begins with the health system in Utah, LDS Hospital, CoStar um, at Harvard, uh, El Camino in uh, the Bay Area, uh, the Public Health Ambulatory Medical Information System uh, here in Seattle. Uh, the VA was an early adopter in, uh, we'll say 2000, uh, excuse me, 1985 for DHCP. Uh, EPIC, the system that we use today, began in 1992 fairly recently followed uh, soon by a uh, Cerner power chart. The VA moved to CPRS in 1997. Group Health uh, used uh, EPIC as one of the earlier doctors, not as early as we were. Uh, and Swedish uh, in 2009 switched to EPIC. And the Mayo Clinic, where Henry Plummer developed the first uh, modern record in uh, the early 19, uh, 1900s, switched to uh, EPIC uh, just about two weeks ago. Now, locally, um, we were early adopters also. Um, Chip Rice, a surgeon at Harborview, along with John Brim, uh, who is uh, in Seattle now, uh, helped develop MTech used in the trauma ICU at Harborview. We used this as CIS throughout our system. In 1997, um, Mindscape was developed. Uh, Jim Lujerfo was here. Peter Tarsi Hornock, many others worked on this uh, very hard. Uh, it's still in use today. And EPIC uh, was first used in the, what was then the UW um, Physicians Network as it began in 1997. Uh, it was not available in the inpatient uh, setting. Uh, Cerner was, but Cerner did not have a substantial offering in the outpatient setting. We adopted Cerner, which we labeled ORCA in 2003, and have used them both <laughs> since. In the later years, uh, since about uh, the late 2000, uh, 2008 or so, we've used these in our 
primary specialty clinics for EPIC and inpatient and emergency room for Cerner, we call this collection of EHRs the mosaic, and we'll have more to say about that. So that's a quick review of our current state, how we arrived there, and some of the problems that we're facing today. Thank you. Uh, in some respects, I think it's probably better to think of it as a chimera, sort of a mythical beast than a mosaic, but uh, that's, a, that's another discussion. So I'd like to turn a little bit and say what really were the drivers of rapid adoption of electronic health records, and the federal government played an enormous role in doing this. And, and there are a lot of very important reasons. I think uh, the widespread adoption and the costs associated with it clearly are a huge project akin to a, to a moonshot. And so this is the kind of thing where federal incentives make a huge difference. The federal government also is essential for setting standards, and, and standards are fundamental to things like interoperability or exchange of information between systems, and without interoperability, there really can't be a, a, you know, widespread adoption. And without standards, I mean, there really is little corporate incentive to have interoperability. It doesn't make sense for Cerner to be able to exchange information for Epic, at least from their corporate standpoint. So there really has to be federal engagement to require uh, interoperability. Uh, the federal government subsidized widespread adoption. And, and the, one of the rationales from the federal government's perspective is, is having electronic records, having data available, really is a necessary, is a prerequisite for driving down the cost curve, for being able to actually measure what we're doing and ultimately drive toward value-based care. So interestingly, the, one of the first major steps toward uh, the electrification of the health record uh, came during the George W. Bush administration in 2004. He said during his State of the Union that year, by computerizing health records, we can avoid dangerous medical mistakes. I think we can ask whether that's exactly correct, reduce costs, uh, and improve care. Uh, that certainly was the goal. And he established something called the Office of National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, which is now referred to as the ONC. Uh, and then in, during the Obama era, as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, there was something called High Tech, which is the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. Uh, and this really provided the structure to incentivize uh, the adopt, widespread adoption of electronic health records. And this was part, really, of a financial stimulus package. A lot of federal spending for, quote unquote, shovel-ready projects that were, that were hopefully going to spark the economy in the aftermath of the financial meltdown. As part of the High Tech Act, really, I think the next step, once you have a law, a well-intentioned law, that gets passed along to the bureaucracy, and that's how regulations happen. And so in, with that equation in mind, uh, all of the regulations re uh, about meaningful use, so-called meaningful use of an electronic health record have been proposed by Medicare and the ONC. And, and these are regulations that require electronic health records to do some things that I think all of us would agree are good. Things like health information exchange, the electronic prescription of medications, uh, measures of, of overall population health. So these are the, uh, the goals, certainly, of meaningful use. The challenge is, is that electronic health records have to be certified in order to, uh, by, certified by the government in order to be able to do the things that are required by meaningful use. And so this poses a very high barrier, I think, for entry into the market. You can imagine, uh, for somebody to come along and try and challenge Epic and Cerner that have substantial footholds in the market and meet all these regulatory requirements, I think, is a very high bar. The other consequence of medical, uh, of meaningful use that I think we're all familiar with is that the requirement to document things in a, in a very specific way, to click a particular box buried down three menus away in order to get credit for something, uh, that's, that's basically the way these EHRs have been designed to be certified. And so in order to comply with these certification requirements, we have to do the things uh, that are required of meaningful use. So 
certainly well-intentioned, but some challenges associated with it. Nonetheless, I think you can see that um, the meaningful use requirements and the High Tech Act had a profound impact on the adoption of medical records. Certainly, if you look back from 2001 up till 2009, clearly this is a trend already. Adoption of, of medical records was already happening. And I think it makes sense. Computers are very good at remembering things. There's a lot of complex data in medical records. It seems like a natural uh, and, and appropriate use of an electronic system. But then you see an inflection point beginning after 2009 where really adoption takes off and now in 2018 virtually hundred percent of practices and hospitals uh, have been electrified um, you can also look at e-prescribing electronic prescribing of medication as a trend going back into 2008 before the high-tech act only the only the state of Massachusetts uh, prescribe more than 20% of their medications electronically. By 2011, that number had increased to 35 states, exceeding 20%, and, and there were five already. You can see the cluster of the northern Midwestern states and then in the industrial Northeast, well, and Vermont. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I had to stop and decide whether that was Vermont or New Hampshire. I'm not quite sure I have it right. But nonetheless, <laughs> up there in the Northeast, far away from us, uh, those were two clusters where they exceeded 40%. And now by 2014, all states are prescribing more than 50%. And in fact, most are prescribing 70% or higher, including Washington State. So there are some other drivers in addition to kind of the federal incentives of meaningful use and ultimately the penalties for not meeting meaningful use. There also is the driver of patient safety and this is a study, the study that launched a thousand EHRs if you will. This is a study published by David Bates and colleagues at the Brigham and Women's Hospital back in 1998 and really it, it looked at um, the um, what are called non-intercepted serious medication errors, and that's defined as potential adverse drug effects and, uh, and um, serious uh, adverse drug events that were not captured uh, by any other means. And uh, following implementation of a CPOE system, they saw a reduction in the serious uh, medication error by 55% from about 10 per thousand patient days down to about five per thousand patient days. They also did an intervention where they put clinical pharmacists with teams and did a lot of work to try and improve communication between teams. And at least in this study, that so-called team intervention had no additional benefit above what was seen with CPOE. But CPOE, at least in this study, clearly reduced medication errors. The other part of, of medication safety is something called barcode medication administration, which we now do in our hospitals. And you can think of barcode med administration as closing the loop. The same order that I write is the same order that the pharmacists review and approve, and that results in a medication being labeled and dispensed from the pharmacy. And then at the bedside, the nurse scans the patient wristband, the medication, and the electronic health record to say that this order for this patient and this medication are all appropriate. And that closing of the loop uh, really, again, further reduces medication errors. In this case, by about 40% uh, relative risk reduction, an absolute risk reduction of about 5% uh, uh, with uh, BCMA compared with usual care. So in terms of achieving medic medication safety, uh, CPOE and BCMA are fundamental. But I think other things that the electronic health record does uh, really make a profound impact. The order catalog represents our formulary. And within the order catalog, we have standard dosage and routes and so on. So they, these pre-built order sentences uh, make ordering an appropriate drug and an appropriate dose easier. I think the way we structure order sets clearly has an influence on, on ordering behavior. Uh, things that are present, if you build it, they will come. Things that are present within order sets are more likely to be ordered than things that aren't present in order sets. And we can 
Uh, in working with the pharmacy, we can preferentially choose more efficacious medications or preferentially choose less expensive medications. And then finally, there's a whole class of things that we call clinical decision support. Uh, and it, this includes things like drug allergy alerts, drug drug alerts, and drug condition rules and alerts. Drug condition being things like this medication is unsafe in pregnancy, for example, and you might have a, an alert. Now, we recognize the potential here for alert fatigue, and we are firing alerts at people constantly throughout the course of medication ordering, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. And there certainly are examples of people, you know, simply flying past alerts, not seeing them, not cognitively processing that information. We recognize that's a challenge, and I think there are some, there's some hope on the horizon of how to make these alerts better, safer, more efficacious. But nonetheless, they're, a, they're an integral part of what we think of as, as achieving medication safety. Now, locally, we've done a variety of things. Uh, we've done a variety of research projects here with our EHR in an effort to improve the quality of care or improve safety. This is a study that uh, Mitchell Kim, uh, Steve Mitchell, among others, uh, May Reed from Geriatrics, did in our emergency rooms at Harborview and, and UWMC. And what we did was we changed the emergency department order set so that if a patient comes in and they're 65 years or older, they would, the ordering provider would preferentially see medications at a dose that was more appropriate for geriatric populations. So lower doses of, of opiates, lower doses of benzodiazepines, lower doses of NSAIDs. And in this study, uh, the introduction of these new order sets resulted in a significant, about 5% uh, increase in the ordering of more appropriate uh, dosages. Um, I think a lot of the ordering that happens in the emergency department is separate from order sets, so they're just kind of writing one-off orders for medications, and we really didn't have a way of controlling those doses with this intervention. But nonetheless, I think this intervention demonstrates that simply by changing order sets, we can influence ordering behavior in a way that we think supports patient safety. There was no significant uh, change in benzodiazepine or NSAID prescribing. Uh, I will point out that these were relatively low ends, so uh, I think there was a reduction or an improvement rather in benzodiazepine um, ordering more appropriate doses, but it didn't reach statistical significance. Another study that we did, this comes from uh, Eric Tannenbaum and Pranodi, uh, Pranodi uh, Hiramath, um, residents in our program. Uh, and uh, their idea was to change the way Brad Anawalt was a part of this project, and, and uh, uh, they uh, proposed that changing telemetry orders would result in less telemetry utilization. Telemetry, you can think of as, as being problematic for a variety of reasons. It's a limited resource. It's tethering the patient with wires. Uh, it's not, and, and I think in certain instances it clearly is a benefit, but in many of the times we use it, there really is no clear benefit. So what we did here was we uh, changed the order sets so that the telemetry orders included an, an indication. And with that indication was a standard duration. So for example, if you presented with an, uh, a rule out MI, the standard duration of telemetry might be 24 hours. Whereas if you had severe heart failure, there would be no specific duration. And then we paged people when that duration had expired. We said, do you still need telemetry for this patient? And we, we paged them using cores, which is a, again one of the innovations that we've done here in our EHR. Uh, and we could contact directly the primary team, the person most responsible for care of the patient. And what we saw following that intervention was a decline in the number of telemetry orders per 100 patient days uh, on medicine services and particularly on the teaching medicine services at Harborview. Uh, there was no significant change in the hospital medicine service that was already doing a pretty good job with this. Um, the other point that I'll make is that more patients had telemetry intentionally discontinued prior to discharge. So a lot of times people get put on telemetry and admission, and then nobody thinks about it again 
until it gets discontinued at the time of discharge. And we saw a significant increase in the intentional discontinuation of telemetry following this intervention. Finally, uh, this is my favorite. And this is my favorite because it's an intervention that has virtually no cognitive impact. It doesn't really ask much of the ordering provider. What, uh, this shows uh, on these two slides, or these two uh, pictures, graphs here, show that following the implementation of CPOE, there's a dramatic increase in the inappropriate ordering of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. And, and you can see this inflection point that's sudden and fairly dramatic. Um, and it turns out that when we, in, in the pre-CPOE days, we would write a paper order, vitamin D. And then a, a unit clerk would look on the form for orders. The only vitamin D order on that form was a 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is appropriate in the vast majority of cases. Uh, and that would be the one that would be chosen. When we created the CPOE order catalog, you can see that dihydroxy vitamin D and hydroxy vitamin D are virtually indistinguishable by name. And so what we saw was that there was a huge increase in inappropriate ordering of dihydroxy vitamin D. And more often than not, people were ordering both. Because obviously they, they just didn't, you know, weren't really thinking in the moment, it's got to be one of these, right? One of these has to be the right one. <laughs> So there were a bunch of suggestions. We need an alert. We need a hard stop. We need to remove this from the order catalog. Any number of relatively more draconian invasive interventions. And instead, what we did is we simply changed the names. And we named the dihydroxy vitamin D, vitamin D 125 hydroxy rare endocrine disorder to simply reflect the relative infrequency with which this is appropriate to order. And the vitamin D hydroxy, uh, common deficiency level. And you can see following this intervention, again, there is a, re a, a steep and immediate decline in the inappropriate order of vitamin D, of the dihydroxy vitamin D. Um, this is work that was done with Andrew White, Noah Hoffman from Lab Medicine, Christy McKinney, who is the uh, research um, affiliate with our uh, GIM program. But this has relatively little, it doesn't require much of the ordering provider, and it had a profound impact. The next thing I want to talk about is, what I think what I'll refer to as the ascent of humans. There's some things, uh, I think there, you, you may hear a lot about artificial intelligence. I think there's a lot to be said from natural intelligence. The humans in the room that really make a, a huge difference in the delivery of patient care. And we've turned to humans to improve a lot of workflows that were a little bit broken by uh, the introduction of electronic health rec uh, uh, records. One example is medication reconciliation. If we put specialized trained persons into the room to do careful medication reconciliation in the electronic health record, that ends up being a better thing. They do it, a pharmacy techs, or nurses or pharmacists, a variety of people who are specifically trained to do this, take better medication histories and they're more accurate than we are in the course of our busy uh, admitting days, for example. We've also recently introduced something called pharmacy managed antibiotics. This is where uh, if I order vancomycin or aminoglycosides, the pharmacist will take that order and run with it. They'll check levels, they'll adjust doses as necessary, they communicate back with the teams. And in, when studied, this has a dramatic impact on the safety of, uh, of it, vancomycin and aminoglycoside administration. Finally, another example is uh, the, the, the many people who are engaged in discharge coordination. We rely on the medical record to help us understand how we're progressing toward discharge, but the intervention of people to sort of coordinate what's left to be done, what has to be done in follow-up, that remains an invaluable piece. I think we have social workers who do this largely at UWMC, and uh, continuity of care nurses or CCNs at Harborview, and they make a tremendous difference. Last, I would be remiss in talking about um, the ascent of humans without reference to, I think, a favorite for all of us, the scribe. Uh, 
And I, I want to, in talking about scribes, I think there's some evidence that scribes improve patient satisfaction, I'm sorry, improve physician satisfaction, improve physician efficiency, improve certain quality of care measures. You can imagine that a trained scribe is better at finding the menu buried two clicks away to, to check a particular box. Uh, and scribes, I think, do make an impact, but clearly they're an expense. They're another person in the room and a patient encounter. Um, and I want to use this quote from Bob Walker and Jeff Goldsmith in a recent uh, article in the uh, Harvard Business Review. Pressure from angry users uh, has produced a medieval solution. Hospital and clinics have hired tens of thousands of scribes literally to follow clinicians around and record their notes and orders into the EHR. Only in healthcare, it seems, could we find a way to automate that ends up adding staff and costs. The other thing about this uh, uh, drawing that I want to point out, this is one of the first examples of a group visit, which was, even in medieval days, was a, a relatively innovative approach. So we're highlighting uh, work of our department and our school in many of these examples. Um, I want to mention another problem we're working to solve, and that is improving the quality of the inpatient progress notes used on our medicine services at Harborview and the U. Um, we uh, received some funding uh, from the Department of Medicine Accelerator Grant Program, and so uh, Carolyn C., Pallavi Aurora, Allison Brazzati, and I are engaged in a study of our current state, and uh, through focus groups and through detailed analysis, we've been working on the question of are we satisfied with the current state, and if we are not, how might we improve it? Uh, and this is going to lead a, a treasure trove of, of analysis of where we stand today, how much of the note is the same as it was the day before, whether that's a good thing or not, and when those notes are available, and who reads them, and when. So that is uh, work underway. Uh, we recently uh, completed a study funded by AHRQ on the use of voice to create inpatient progress notes, which uh, in brief summary is appealing to some but not to all. It's an alternative to using a keyboard and a template. Um, but I think uh, many people find that speaking or dictating is a more natural way um, to communicate than typing. In fact, I've noticed that Paul and I are doing more talking today than we are typing. And so communication by voice uh, has its role. Uh, another area where um, we need help as humans is in analyzing and absorbing a, uh, the fire hose of information that comes to us in clinical care. And here's an example. This is a CT report from a trauma victim at Harborview. It was a woman who was in a motorcycle accident. And uh, it's fairly lengthy. Uh, it's a real report. I took out the identifiers. Um, and I'm sure after looking at it, you immediately see uh, the problems that this person has. Um, but in case you didn't see them all, I'm going to expand the impression section at the bottom. Um, and this shows that this, uh, this patient had a number of problems, including uh, fractures, blood in the chest, and many other life-threatening problems that were addressed immediately in the emergency room. But in addition, the radiologist noted um, a right agnexal cyst that um, recommended, for which uh, follow-up was recommended. The challenge here is that the person who will be ordering that follow-up is not the trauma surgeon to whom this was verbally communicated. It's someone else. It may be in a different state. And so sometimes this sort of crucial information is missed. So. Um, Martin Gunn uh, in radiology, Emilia Yediskin in uh, biomedical informatics, and I worked on several studies to try to find these small needles in the haystack of information so that they can be brought to the attention of the right person uh, to take action. Um, and this is actually now uh, in commercial production and should be available to us um, before long. It's very helpful to have assistance with um, uh, assimilating all of this information and, and not forgetting things. Uh, there are other examples of where computing power might help, and you may have noticed some of these. In both of our EHRs, Cerner and Epic, there is a feature that allows you to search through the entire record for a concept. You don't have to pick the right word. You can say fungal infection, and it will show you notes where histoplasmosis is mentioned. 
uh, and that is done very, very quickly using the same technology that is used for uh, many other uses of uh, natural language processing in our record. In the EPIC world, you can type in, uh, for example, dyspnea, and included in the returned uh, results will be an echocardiogram report that's relevant to your question about dyspnea. So these are examples of um, solving the problem that we now face, which is that we have an enormous amount of information and no more time to, um, to study it. We need help with that. So, uh, for those of us who have um, an interest in scholarly activities using patient information, uh, I find this graph to be um, uh, quite helpful. It's a, uh, a diagram created by Arcadia uh, Healthcare, and what it shows is that on the x-axis uh, there, uh, there are sections, each of which correspond to a single patient's record. Above the x-axis in green is the information that exists in claims data, so ICD-10 codes, um, that sort of thing. Below the horizontal axis in the inverted mountain are the data that exists in the electronic health record, the notes, the orders, um, all the other detail that we find in the record. So what you can see here is that there is enormous potential to know more about the care we deliver and the way that Florence Nightingale hoped would occur uh, when she wrote her book, um, and it's happening. We have just an enormous amount of information. Now, we are using it for research and for quality improvement. I'll mention just a few examples here. Uh, you've heard at this podium in Grand Rounds many of our um, uh, presentations that reference the importance of the EHR. Um, one of my favorite examples is from the New England Journal uh, several years ago from Stanford using their Stride Warehouse, which is their repository, where they used the data on patients, uh, young children with lupus uh, and kidney disease to help in decision making for a particular patient who had a very uncommon constellation of symptoms and they were puzzled as to what to do. The literature did not provide guidance. They looked in their own repository, found several similar children and uh, noticed a trend and followed that trend and the, the child improved. Now it's an anecdote but it shows the promise of doing this on a broader scale. Um, we have our own repository. We're very fortunate to have the Amalga repository that many of you are familiar with. That gathers data from all of our EHRs and many other sources, and it is available with appropriate re uh, review um, by human subjects for you to conduct um, research. Uh, Mark Werfel, uh, Dave Carlbaum, and others have used uh, these kinds of data for um, for work on early identification of ARDS and, uh, and sepsis. Uh, there's going to be a, a friendlier front end to this that Peter uh, Tarsi Hornock and his team have developed called LEAF, which means that it will, won't require as much expertise to take advantage of this data. The eMERGE uh, uh, consortium, that's Electronic Medical Records and Genomics, is a multi-center um, trial funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute uh, and it's uh, engaged in developing methods and best practices for using the um, EHR as a tool for genomics research. Locally, um, our uh, participation is led by Gail Jarovic, Eric Larson, and Dave Croslin are also involved in this. So that's the current. I think it would be worth um, reflecting a little bit on the future. What does the future hold for us? Um, and I'll mention um, a, a few of these. Um, uh, there are, uh, there is progress in health information exchange. Uh, Care Everywhere is an example of this that I use in my clinic. Um, there will be enormous uh, growth in asking patients how they think they are doing, patient reported outcomes. And we heard John Spertus, uh, I think several years ago, give grand rounds on that very subject. This is uh, going to be available to us and is increasingly um, appropriate for many of our patients who have uh, information to report to us on how they've progressed. Precision medicine is another exciting area that, of course, we have local experts uh, working uh, in. Um, we're working on uh, secure communication because we know that when things go wrong in our system, communication is often a contributor to that problem. Um, we are also, as Paul mentioned, we're working on better, smarter, actionable alerts if you want to go further into the future, uh, I recommend looking at this video prepared by CRICO, which is the malpractice carrier for the, um, for the Harvard system. Uh, it's, a, it's a 
uh, it's fiction, but it shows their view of how an electronic medical record and how we interact with it might be in the future. Now that is a little bit out there. You won't see that at the Epic or Cerner shows, but uh, I, I personally like it. And if you're interested, we have references at the end. You can view it yourself. Um, there's a company in town that has a meeting once a year, um, and this one was in Las Vegas last year. Maybe this is uh, Amazon. So Amazon Web Services has a big conference sold out. There are many, many sessions on healthcare and healthcare IT. Um, and so the changes we see may arise from sectors of technology who are not fully engaged in healthcare today. And uh, my own view is that um, I, I welcome them to, to help with some of the problems um, we, we experience. Uh, now, what will that mean for our current generation of EHRs, in which we've in, invested a, a very large amount and are continuing to do so? Well, uh, there is the idea that EHRs will become platforms. They'll become foundations on which we build systems that we use uh, and we interact with. So uh, the EHR would be responsible for some of the essential uh, roles that are very complex and very risky, such as communication of orders, um, maintaining the legal record, and so on. But apps and extensions to the record would build on that foundation for interaction that we're more, we're more um, comfortable with. Uh, and that, I think, is an area that would be very welcome. Um, the uh, App Store model is well understood, and that may be the way uh, this would work. You have your core EMR. On top of it are the things that you actually see and interact with. And by the way, this slide in this movement uh, uh, owes a lot to uh, one of our EHR vendors. Um, who, they're very interested in this concept because they see that there's so much to do that no single company is going to be able to do it all. We put together a uh, large multidisciplinary group in the American Medical Informatics Association that uh, I've been involved with heavily. Um, and we asked the question, what should we be doing in the next five years to improve EHRs? And um, this group uh, includes uh, patient representatives, technologists, physicians, nurses, many others. Uh, it was uh, a wonderful experience to hear their perspectives. And to briefly summarize uh, um, what we found, uh, what we concluded, was that we should start with making EHRs um, easier for documentation and make those documentation requirements themselves easier. Um, we should refocus regulations so that the patients and caregivers derive most of the benefit. It isn't for some third party, it's for the person in front of you. Um, and that, uh, I think, is uh, a, 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 the point here is that regulation could, could be directed in the right uh, direction instead of in a way that we might think is a little bit um, tangential to the best use of regulation. We'd like to increase transparency. It should be possible to show screenshots to show uh, stories of where a problem occurred and how we got around it. Um, we should foster innovation. Um, we should bring into the solving of the health IT problems groups that are very skilled at doing so, but haven't yet uh, uh, worked hard in the health uh, domain. And we should support person-centered care. Uh, even though we call them electronic health records, most of what these contain today are the episodes of illness and health problems that people experience. Most people spend most of their lives outside of a uh, healthcare institution. Our record should incorporate their experience, their living uh, situation, their exercise, their diet, and so on. So these were the recommendations that um, uh, I think were a, a welcome answer to Krasinski's observation that we have problems that really begs the question, what do we do about it? And this was the basis for my testimony before the U.S. Senate, because uh, the uh, um, Patty Murray um, was one of the people who saw this report, and um, uh, I told them a little bit more about it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, another very inspiring um, advantage of electronic records that I'd like to draw attention to is this movement to share the record with people. Um, I credit Harold Goldberg, formerly in our department, he has passed away, who in 2008 started a program called Health Reach, um, which was used in my clinic at Roosevelt and also at Harborview. Uh, and this has been followed by a nationwide movement um, in which we participate. 
Uh, and the idea is that when you write a record, when you write a note in clinic and you sign it, the person can view it themselves. Uh, and that has been true, as you know, here in UW uh, Medicine since 2014. All of our notes are available for patients to read, uh, with exception of the emergency room and the inpatient, which is ahead of us. We've studied the effect of this. I'll highlight work by um, Sharisha Donareddy, uh, Joanne Elmore, James Ralston on the impact of this on patients and their engagement and the potential for this to further improve um, their uh, participation in their own care. Uh, and then uh, we have a great paper by Jared Klein, also in our department, who points out that um, we have to be aware of this and we need to be respectful in what we put. Um, one of our colleagues, I won't single out, said that uh, patients are great at looking at their notes. Um, they object to almost nothing that I say, as long as I don't use the word obese. <laughs> so it turns out patients are humans too. Um, so the future for UW Medicine, which is probably on your minds, um, here is a summary of where we stand today uh, in our uh, potential future. Uh, there is, as you likely know, a proposal called Financial Improvement and Transformation, and that includes improvements in our infrastructure, which would um, provide EHR funding. The University of Washington Board of Regents will consider this proposal this summer. Um, if the proposal is approved, we will launch clinical transformation. All of us will launch this. Um, we will make a transition to a single EHR across patient experience throughout UW Medicine. Uh, and this will be um, a, a very big initiative. It will be literally transforming. And um, all of you will, um, I hope, be participants in this. And we certainly want your continued feedback. We, we benefit from the feedback you give us now. Uh, we're going to be asking for even more of it. So, summary. So we think that there are reasons for hope. Uh, there are a few things that I want to highlight here, things that work well. CORES is a great example. Eric Van Eaton and colleagues uh, developed CORES locally. Um, and it was, uh, it was sort of an example of one of these sort of bolt-on applications to our EHR and now has been incorporated into the EHR and has been very successful. Uh, I think uh, Eric and his now Company Transformative Med have also developed something called glycemic care uh, in concert with uh, Brett Vissa uh, over at Harborview. And I think that's a very good example of how to review your patient's uh, recent insulin use and, and glycemic uh, uh, results uh, in the chart. Uh, as Tom alluded to earlier, there's chart search in both of our medical records that allow you to use, I think, uh, develop pretty smart and useful conceptual searches within the chart. Care Everywhere, I think, is another example of something that works pretty well. It's a, it's a way in which, in Epic at least, we can easily look at records from all over the country, potentially. Uh, there's the potential certainly for information overload, but I think Care Everywhere um, uh, is a, is a very helpful thing. And then finally, just the availability of images and radiology reports online in both of our systems uh, has made a tremendous difference. I think uh, many of our surgical colleagues, for example, talk about the ease with which they can access uh, radiology reports and images in, wherever they are. We are early in this transformation. I think you often hear analogies to the um, aeronautics industry and to the aviation industry, rather. Uh, and the aviation industry has been working at this kind of problem, how to do alerts and how to, how to improve safety for many, many years, longer than we have with the electronic health record. So we're still early. They haven't yet delivered on the promise of improving care or improving efficiency, but I think there's, uh, there's some early evidence of benefit and there certainly is hope. I think the challenges remain whether we see largely incremental improvements originating from our existing EHR vendors, or as Tom mentioned, really this sort of disruptive technology, the introduction of, of, of uh, is Warren Buffett and Jamie Dimon uh, going to come along and, and do something dramatic in the electronic health record space? Is Amazon, will Google, I think these remain, uh, or will it be some, uh, you know, uh, operation originating in a garage? Um, 
Our commitment through all this is to try and make things better for our patients, to improve patient safety, to improve the care of patients. And we view you as one of our primary customers. And so we're interested in hearing from you. We're interested in working with you and partnering with you in improving the physician experience, improving patient care. So we, will, of course, want to thank uh, a cast of thousands. And we won't go through all of this. Uh, but we want to uh, show you the, the uh, small army of IT physicians that work with us. Uh, we recently have some new trainees. There's a clinical informatics fellowship uh, through the Department of, of Family Medicine. Uh, and we have now our second class of fellows uh, with us. Uh, Leo Liu is one of our residency graduates, and Craig Monson is an uh, internal medicine doc from the Brigham. Uh, and now this year we have two uh, pediatricians, Tok Sakande and Reza Sadigian, uh, who are with us. And so this, is, this has been a, a great leavening, new introduction of, of fresh blood. We have some other important co collaborators, Anna Marty, who is the nurse who knows everything about everything in the EHR. Uh, Wendy Giles, our recently retired uh, uh, major domo in IT services. I want to introduce uh, Joy Grosser who is our new chief information officer, came to us from Cincinnati, Cleveland. And a lot of other people, yeah. including many of you in the audience. Um, Paul and I have worked together for 20 years. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your kind attention.